Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is, of course, our weekly Q&A session. You ask the tech-related Mountain Bike questions and we give you the answers you need. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments, let us know underneath down there. If there's any questions, use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and we'll get back to you. Okay, so first up is from DAVID. Hey Doddy, I've got a 2019 Nuke Proof Scout and I want to learn to service my forks at home so I don't have to pay for someone at my bike shop. My question is, can I do fork service outside or is there any danger of dust, pollen or other stuff getting inside the seals? I don't really have any room to do it inside the house. Um, to be honest, as long as there's no sort of construction work going on with excessive dust and that, you should be fine. Bear in mind that many race mechanics have to work outdoors in pit areas. Now, most of them will be working under an easy up, so they'll be covered from rain and things like that. So needless to say, you wanna keep your fork as dry as you can when you're working on it, other than the lubricants you're putting inside. Um, but more specific stuff, if you ever went into the world of shocks with shims and things, then of course you're gonna to need to be in a bit more of a cleaner environment due to the nature of small parts. But really, use your common sense, it should be fine. Uh, just make sure that there's no any obvious dirt or foreign debris getting inside your fork and you should be good. Um, good luck. Next up is from Burn Duration. What would result in more cornering grip, lower tire pressures or knobbier tire treads, given the same tire volumes for the same corner? Perhaps GMBN could do a video on maximum cornering speeds with Blake quantitatively testing a range of tire pressures and tire knob profiles on the same corner. Um, well, first up, yeah, I love the idea of uh, actually seeing what makes a difference on the corner. And in fact, I've got a better idea than even using Blake for that. Um, we've got a friend of ours, it's a stuntman, and I reckon he could go a little bit harder and maybe sacrifice himself uh, in the name of entertainment and science. So we'll come back to you on that one. Um, I've mentioned a few times that I would suggest that tire pressure makes more of a significant difference than anything else. Um, a good example of that would be wet rock, for example. Now, no amount of tire uh, lugs or anything like that are going to claw into that and do anything. The actual adhesion of the tyre manipulating around the rock by changing your tyre pressure will make more of a difference. However, you get the opposite thing in wet mud, uh, in particular that thick sort of mud. So, by lowering your tyre pressure you, you get a bigger footprint, you're spreading out the surface area more, which is great for traction when you're just rolling through. But if you're cornering, the tyre can still slide around on the surface, whereas a tyre that's got a real heavy open tread design, big lugs on the side there, that can really cut in and claw into like the harder stuff underneath. So they're two totally different situations where one where a tyre pressure makes more of a difference and the other one where the tyre tread makes more of a difference. Uh, for example, there's a couple of different options of tyre tread on screen. Here's one that's a bit more closely packed. Uh, you're gonna benefit more in various conditions with tyre pressure experimentation with this one than you would be with this one, which because it's got those big lugs, you want those lugs to cut in and not necessarily to form around stuff quite as much. Um, but yeah, I reckon there could be a good trail side comparison video in there. So all jokes aside, I think we will make something along those lines. And actually, if there's any other comparison videos you think myself or Henry or any other GMBN presenters should be making, let us know. Henry's obviously made some pretty cool ones recently looking at uh, XC tire, I think he did, versus Enduro tire. And even the rolling resistance with the similar tire pressure was insane, the difference. Mind you, they are literally like half the weight, the uh, cross country tires against the Enduro ones, but still it's quite interesting stuff. I'm planning on making some suspension related ones so uh, keep an eye out for those on the channel but let us know if you've got any sort of uh, testing features you want us to make. Let us know in those comments. Okay over to Anonymous PH next. Hi Dolly, I've been wondering lately if I could go for a tubeless setup for my 26 inch hardtail. The problem is uh, the tubeless rim available in the shops is a bit wide for me, it's 40 millimeters. Can I use my non-tubeless ready rim to be set up tubeless and will it be okay when hitting jumps? Uh, I have a doubt of it burping and handling big impacts. Yeah, um, it should be fine, okay? So there's always gonna be exceptions to the rule, but give or take, most rims you can make them tubeless compatible. The biggest thing you have to do is seal off that rim bed on there. And then of course, you're gonna have to make sure you get some decent tubeless valves. Now I say this, this is really important because one of the biggest areas where you're gonna get a leak on the rim is from the valve itself. And it's not the valve having a problem, it's the valve having a leak around where it penetrates the rim itself. So you'll notice there's a little rubber grommet around the top of the valve. Some tubeless valves, like the Muckoff ones for example, come with various different rubber bungs there to 
suit the different profiles of the inside of the rim. That is the key to getting a good seal at that point. So before you go spending your money, inspect the profile of the inside of your rim. It might be completely flat, it might be square, or it might be concave, like a kind of uh, top of a skateboard, I guess you could say. And all you want is for the rubber bung that you're putting in there on that valve stem to replicate that and then you'll get a really good fit. Now there is one problem that you do get on some rims. It tends to happen on more budget rims because of the way that they're constructed than it does on higher end rims, but you can still get this on various bikes where you think you're getting a bit of a leak and you can't figure out where it's coming from. So bearing in mind the whole idea of doing the tubular setup is you use a tubular specific valve so that it goes straight through to the outside of the rim and you can inflate pressure straight into the tire cavity there. And the other one of course is to cover up the holes that the nipples have on the rims but sometimes on rims, where the, the process of a rim being joined, they're extruded as a single piece and they're wrapped around and they're pinned in the middle there. That join sometimes can have a very fine hole that no sealant will plug up and you'll permanently have a slow puncture. I mean, it's extremely rare, but I have had this on a couple of bikes over the years. So uh, just check the quality of your rim and if in doubt, maybe it's not the right one. Okay, now it's time for Phil Gordon. Hey guys, loving the show. Recently, my rear hub failed on some trails that I'd driven 480 kilometers to ride. Ugh, gutted, mate. Um, turns out the hub center, the ratchet part, is bonded into the wheel. And I've had, um, and this let go, so I couldn't pedal effectively. The wheel was replaced under warranty, but I feel like I can no longer trust this particular brand. Uh, the wheel in question was the Bontrager Line Pro. How common is this fault, and are all wheels made in the same way? Okay, so the bit that you're talking about, the ratchet ring, on, on a hub you get two different types. You get the pull and you get the ratchet, basically. The pull is on the freewheel body and it basically indexes onside the ratchet. Now that ring that is in the hub can be, I guess, one of three things. It could be part of the hub shell itself, which it sounds like it might be on yours, and it can also be an insert. If it's an insert, it means that part can be replaced. It's just a component. Uh, now that insert itself can either be pressed in or it can be threaded in. When they're threaded in, they thread in the opposite way to the revolution so obviously they don't come undone as you're pedaling. Um, it's quite rare to be honest I think you're unlucky I don't think it's a problem the wheel Bontrager can make great wheels um, I think it is just an unlucky one but it can happen I have seen this happen on bikes before and I've also seen this happen on the other part of the hub I've seen the the pull mechanisms crack before I've seen them come out I've seen the springs disappear I've seen all sorts of different parts of the hub disintegrate over the years I think you're just unlucky however it would be keeping uh, keeping an eye on these sort of things in future might prevent these things happening um, because my guess is that it might have had a hairline crack in it which you could have seen if you did some routine maintenance and obviously at some point under pressure it cracked and it completely gave way and obviously at that point then the ratchet doesn't do anything because it can't engage it's just going to slip um, obviously sounds like you could have had a nasty accident though because um, those sort of things happening are never good uh, I think you're just unlucky but I'm glad you're not hurt next up is from Ethan Payton uh, hi guys, I recently demoed a Giant Rain 29er Pro Zero with 170mm fork, but it's way out of my price range. If I got the Rain 2 alloy, how could I make it feel agile for a Rain on the trail just like the Pro? Thanks. Uh, well, simply put, uh, by losing a bit of weight. Um, they're both excellent bikes, they're both fundamentally the same. One is carbon, one is alloy, one has a very high spec, one has a more price point spec. But essentially it's the same bike, and you could Basically, over time, you could upgrade the cheaper rain to feel very close to the high performance one and the lighter weight of that pro one. Of course, it's going to be carbon, so it's never going to be quite as light as the alloy one you have. Uh, the biggest thing you can do initially, I, I would suggest, is looking at the wheels. So I've just got the comparison bit up on the site. So if you look on screen now, you'll see the comparison chart. This is a really cool feature on the Giant website, actually. You can click a bike you're interested in, click compare, find another model, click compare, and it puts two charts up so you can directly compare the features. So I'm looking at the two on screen, and of course, yeah, so the alloy frame is gonna be heavier. Um, however, the shock on it is gonna be lighter because it hasn't got a piggyback on there. It's a much bigger shock unit that's on that Pro. Uh, the fork will be heavier and the dropper post will be slightly heavier. It's not as light as the reverb that's on that Pro model. Um, the controls on the bike, so arguably the bar and stem, things like that. But they're, they're all small upgrades you can make in time. They won't make a significant difference to start with. The cassette, however, will make a massive difference. 
Now the cheaper SRAM cassettes are very heavy, they're made of steel. Uh, they, are, they basically represent great value for money, uh, but they are much heavier than the alloy ones, uh, the, the way they're made basically on the top end ones. Uh, don't go replacing that straight away though. Our best advice with these sort of things is wear them out. Uh, just go and ride them until they're basically worn and then you can spend a bit more money. It gives you time to save up as well and upgrade for the lighter, better one. Uh, the benefits of that, of course, is going to be lighter. It can be more durable as well, so it can last you longer. The downside, of course, is it's going to cost you more, so you will need to save up for that. Uh, but the wheels straight out is going to make the biggest single difference. So if you're going to go for that cheaper option and you really want it to ride lighter, getting yourself some lighter wheels will make the best difference. So on the more expensive one, you've got giant TRX uh, 29 composite wheels. And on the alloy one, you've got the giant all mountain 29 uh, 30 mil alloy wheels. Nothing wrong with alloy wheels, they work absolutely great, um, but they're definitely heavier. So that is somewhere where you could save some weight. Uh, the tyres are essentially the same between the two. Um, I believe the carcasses are slightly lighter on the Pro model, um, but they're fundamentally the same thing. Just use them until they're worn out, and then if that's not much of an issue, you can change to a lighter tyre. Or failing that, if you wanted your bike to just feel like it rolls a bit quicker, uh, get a faster rolling rear tyre, and that can also get around that issue. And let's not forget the most important thing is get the bike set up in the first place will make a massive difference. Get your suspension set up with the correct amount of sag, make sure it feels as sort of light and sprightly as it can, uh, and just enjoy riding it. And you'll actually kind of forget about that expensive one because you'll be too much having too much fun on the one that you've actually bought. Um, but get involved. Uh, upgrading a bike is fantastic. Uh, this one's actually just a comment, I didn't see this one. This one's from Freight Train Shane. Yes, a tire repair video refresher would be great. Uh, thanks guys. Uh, yeah, 100% we're gonna make that video. I think we might try and incorporate a few more things into it. I think the one I did before that I was referencing that you're talking about was when I stitched up the sidewall of a tire. Um, I used a specific type of thread for that that was very strong, but someone actually said in comments, uh, how about using dental floss, because it's essentially like nylon. Uh, yeah, and that's a great shout. So I'm gonna remake that video, show you how easy it is to keep a tire going again when you have slashed it. If nothing else, worth keeping for a spare. So uh, hold that thought and we'll come back to that one. Uh, next up is from Oliver Atwell. Uh, I've been thinking to get a new helmet and I've got an open face helmet currently but I've been wanting a full face for the gnarlier trails. Would you recommend going for a full face with that chin bar on there or a regular one? Um, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, well a good option would be a bit of both. Um, personally I love an open face helmet, I always have, I've ridden in those all of my life. Uh, I do have a full face helmet and I will wear them from time to time but I like the vision, I like feeling the wind on my face, it's kind of how I uh, judge my speed, kind of like a cat using its whiskers, the same sort of theory. As soon as I put a full face helmet on my goggles I feel quite isolated. However some people, I know Blake loves that feeling, he feels invincible when he's got a full face helmet on and uh, well you've seen what Blake can do on a bike. But um, perhaps the solution for you is a convert helmet and what I mean by that is it looks like a full face helmet but it's got a removable jaw guard on there so you kind of get two helmets for the price of one of course they do cost a bit more a bit more uh, like the full face helmet price bracketing but you're getting a great value helmet for money so on screen now you can see a few examples the first one is the Giro switchblade uh, this one actually is more like a, a an open face downhill style helmet and you just take the pure jaw guard off uh, it's really cool it's got loads of protection if you're riding somewhere with really gnarly trails it's it's a really, really good secure option. If you want something a bit more like a conventional open face helmet that has a complete bolt-on jaw guard, uh, check out this one. This is the Bell Super. There's various different specs available, MIPS ones, non-MIPS as far as I know. There's also the Met Parachute, that's this one, and the Liat Enduro 3.0. Uh, all of those helmets, they all pass all of, the, and as far as I know, they all exceed all of the safety standards needed for downhill helmets. Uh, they've got the removable jaw guard, so you could take that with you in your riding bag and ride in your open face moment and then of course you've got the the option of having a jaw guard there so it really does represent great value for money um how about guys um anyone in the comments can you help out oliver have you got one of those convertible helmets uh, let him know in the comments what you think of them do they work well for you uh, which ones have you got any sort of pointers i've never used one of those personally um, i prefer full open or fully uh well full face so let us know in those comments and help them out okay last question this week is from max s 64 are carbon rims and bars better than aluminium? Um, well, in a word, no. Uh, they're just completely different. Uh, different pricing and they've got different ride characteristics on both parts. So let's try and break this down. Carbon generally tends to be more expensive. Not always the case, you can get some great value for money carbon products. Um, alloy tends to be slightly heavier. Again, not always, You are there are some exceptions to the rule. 
Um, you can get alloy wheels that have an element of flex, but also you can get immensely stiff alloy wheels. But to get them that stiff, they tend to be slightly heavier. Uh, carbon wheels tend to be stiffer and lighter, um, which is a desired thing. Although I've got to say, a stiff wheel isn't always the best thing. I'm using two different examples here. So for enduro, uh, you want a wheel that's light and stiff generally. It's obviously got to be strong. Now the stiffness that carbon can have as a trait can be very stiff getting that power transfer down and that can feel amazing when sprinting. But also, and the same when cornering to be fair, but also when coming into a super rough section it can be very hard to hold on. Also it can mean that you lose um, a little bit of ride feel as well because it can be so stiff that you chatter around sometimes and it could be quite hard to be accurate or you have to be really accurate because of the fact they chatter you around a bit. Some people love that feeling though. Um, it's not one I like. I like to have a front wheel that's got a bit more flex to it for a bit more comfort. Uh, out back though, I'm quite happy to have something stiff and of course being a heavier rider, it does make the bike feel good as well. Now, carbon really comes into its own though for cross country wheels. Um, Essentially, cross-country racers want the lightest wheels possible. They want the least rolling resistance. They want to reduce that rolling mass that you have to turn around. And with alloy wheels, it can be very hard getting a wheel that's light enough and stiff enough at the same time. This is where carbon comes in because you can have something that's very light and also it can be stiff enough for power transfer and ride feel. But of course, because they're so light, yet they still have that stiffness to them, they're gonna still have plenty of good riding feel to them. They're not quite as bad as the Enduro ones, which tend to be very strong and stiff. Now, as far as overall strength goes, uh, don't be too concerned about it. Alloy ones being cheaper, if they break, they break. Uh, you can pack man a wheel quite easily um, in both styles, to be fair. If that happens on an alloy one, you can, to a degree, bend it back and continue your ride, uh, whereas a carbon one would tend to crack in that case. Uh, don't be put off by wheels cracking though because many of the brands like Santa Cruz Reserve wheels for example, they offer some kind of like crash replacement policies and some of them even have wheels for life. So uh, check those policies out before you buy anything. Uh, when it comes to handlebars though, uh, I think it's a bit more of a feel thing, a bit different to the wheels outright. So you can get carbon bars that are incredibly stiff and you can get also get carbon bars that are incredibly flexy both offering totally different traits. Um, I don't like a bar that's too stiff. I like an element of flex, but I have ridden some terrifyingly bendy bars in the past. But something you do need to take into account is that it's very easy for a carbon bar to be light and strong. It's just gonna be expensive. So you kind of have to pick one of those things that you want. It's about weighing up your options. Um, but there you go, there's plenty of knowledge there for you, hopefully. Uh, don't forget to hang around, send us some questions. Cheers, guys.